Hi, my name is Sergio Troncoso, and uh, thank you for joining me today again. I wanted to read today from my new novel, which came out in September of 2011. It's called From This Wicked Patch of Dust, and it's a novel uh, set in Isleta, uh, right on the border uh, to Mexico in Texas. And I wanted to read from the beginning of the novel, and then a little further forward into the novel, and finally discuss a little bit some of the things I was focusing and trying to explore in the novel in terms of questions. So this is from the very beginning. Uh, the novel's focused on this Martinez family, and there's six members to the family. Pilar and Cuauhtémoc are the parents, and at this point in the novel, the four children are very small. Uh, Julia is eight years old, and um, Francisco is seven, and Marcos is five, and Ismael, the youngest, is a toddler, is only two years old. So this is toward the very beginning of the novel. Their cars ambled into the Colonia of Isleta, which was a misspelling of Isleta, the Spanish for Little Island, a misnamed, misplaced swath of earth in what had been a prehistoric sea. The gravel slipped under their tires, elevated dirt mounds of irrigation ditches cut short the horizon. The most unusual and even gaudy structure was the Isleta Mission, which had been founded 100 years before the 13 colonies of New England had declared themselves the United States of America. With its three-story cupola, crumbly white stucco walls and rickety wooden fence, the mission had attracted a small settlement of adobe shacks. Mount Carmel was a warehouse-like new church with a gray asphalt roof and cinder block walls and lay to one side of the mission, anchoring a dusty little square against a grim and boundless desert. Pilar pointed out the church to the children and explained its role in Christianizing the Tigua Indians, who still lived in Isleta. Will they shoot us with arrows? No, Panchito, these Indians don't do that anymore. At the end of the dust and road, Cuauhtémoc finally found the old one-lane wooden bridge across an irrigation canal that joined Old Pueblo and Socorro Road. The Impala's white-walled wheels rattled each plank on the swaying bridge. Don Pedro waited till Cuauhtémoc's car was on Socorro Road before guiding his station wagon onto the bridge. After a few minutes of bumps and near stops, the cars turned onto a nameless street of hard-packed dirt. In the hazy morning daylight of the lower valley, Pilar could distinguish the few scattered shacks of their neighbors, as well as the wooden stakes and neon pink plastic ribbons that marked the boundaries of purchased yet still empty lots. About halfway down the dirt street, the pale green Chevy Impala stopped in front of a chain-link fence and an unplastered adobe house with sheets of plywood for doors. One side of the front yard was a giant mound of gravel and sand for mixing cement. The other side was a gigant gigantic four-foot cube of adobe with stalks of thick yellow straw intermittently protruding from the rough brown brick like crooked antenna. Behind the chain-link fence was a small runoff canal cut into the sand and subsoil. This is our house, niños, Pilar announced before she pushed open the heavy car door. Here? Yes, here. But, 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 but there are no windows, eight-year-old Julia, the oldest, stammered. When we get more money, we'll get windows. What, what about the rain? It doesn't rain in Isleta. Never? Almost never. What, what do you mean by almost? Barely, rarely in the summer. Don't worry, Julia. We'll have windows in a few months, before it gets cold in October. Now take Panchito and Marcos and keep them busy outside. Don't go into the canal. What canal? The one behind the house. Why can't we go there? It's full of spiders and snakes and niños de la tierra. If one bites you, you will die. Will, will, we, will we really die? 
Well, maybe you'll just get sick. You mean like throw up? Yes, you'll throw up all day, Pilar said, searching for Cuauhtémoc, who had been unloading the Impala's trunk. You cannot go into the canal, is that understood, Julieta? Si, sí, mamá. Julia ran to the chain-link fence, waited for her father to open the gate's lock as he came back for another load from the car, and ran toward the mounds of sand and gravel. Francisco and Marcos chased her. Pilar lost sight of them as they hid behind the stacks of adobe. Only their giggles echoed in the deserted street. There are niños de la tierra in those adobe bricks too, and in the backyard you didn't tell her that. Quotemoc said, his head halfway inside the trunk of the Chevy Impala. I don't want them to get filthy in that canal. God only knows what's in there. You also didn't tell her about no beetles. Which reminds me, I tried to. B I need to buy several extra gallons of kerosene for the lamps and stoves. There was still no electricity in Barraca. The electric company had promised Quotemoc that by the end of the summer, Maybe by early fall, they would put the post and overhead wires in their neighborhood. Pilar had been outraged when he had reported the news to her. You tell them we have children? Babies? She had exclaimed, but other families with children had already been living in Barraca for years. They were only the latest arrival. Pilar and Cuauhtémoc unloaded the final box of pots and pans and canned food from Don Pedro's station wagon. Doña Josefina hovered over the toddler Ismael, those are the grandparents. And Ismael walked cautiously to the fence, gripped the chain link with his chubby hands, and gawked at the half-made adobe house. As soon as Maello napped, Pilar thought, maybe her mother could help her ready the bedroom for the night and cook lunch and dinner. Perhaps Papa could saw the plywood door for the house so that Guatemo could fasten it to the frame before night time. For now an old sh white sheet on nails would do. It was work and more work and in a few days progress and in a few months. Mama! Mama! What happened? Pilar finished tugging the jug of kerosene into a corner where the children would not knock it over. Marcos fell down and he cut his leg and he's bleeding. Where is he? In the back. We were playing hide and seek and I was about to count to 20 and Pancho and Marcos were running and Marcos fell down and Pancho stepped on his leg. My God, that's a deep cut, Nino. Let's wash it with soap and put a bandage on it. Pancho pushed me. He did. He pushed me, Marcos cried, his brown face streaked with dirt, tears leaving behind crooked white lines on his cheek. Pilar glanced at Pancho. The older boy was frightened. His white t-shirt was torn at the belly button and his stomach bulged over his waistband. I don't think he meant to do that. Pancho, go fetch me a bandage from the bedroom. Inside the black shoe box next to my shoes, Julieta, what is Maello doing over there in that corner by himself? He's playing with rocks. Go get him. Mamá está comiendo tierra. Clean his hand and bring him over to the faucet too. Now, Julieta. Julia pushed his mile to the f faucet in the front yard, their only source of running water, until their indoor plumbing was reinstalled and connected to the main water line by Don Chancho. As Pilar kneeled to rinse Marcos's gash, she noticed Maello was grinning. The baby's face was smeared with mud and grime. A muscle spasm rippled across Pilar's back like an electric shock. She closed her eyes and faced the ground on all fours, sweat suddenly dripping from her cold temples. You cannot eat dirt. You cannot push each other. You children need to help me. I can't do this by myself. She yelled to the ground, her head half dizzy, a migraine seemed to want to start and not start inside her head. We're sorry, Mama, we promised to help you. I'm sorry too, me too. On her knees, Pilar blinked and inhaled. She whispered to no one in particular, Why did we come here? 
Why did we come to este maldito terregal? Why to this wicked patch of dust? What have I done? We'll help you, Mama. I know you will, sweetheart. You know I love all of you. We love you too, Mama. Yes, we do. Listen, tell me one thing and I'll let you go play, Pilar said as she struggled to her feet. Say, I'm not sorry for being a niño. I'm proud to be a niño. The children looked at each other quizzically. Pilar smiled at them to reassure them. Just say, I'm proud to be a niño. Say it loudly so even la viejita Doña Hortensia can hear you. It'll make me feel better. Please do this for your mama. I'm a niño. Niño. I'm muy proud to be a niño. Thank you. Now go and play and be careful. Pilar watched them sprint to the other side of the house beyond her view. Above a biplane gently descended to the cotton fields on avenues of the Americas. The biplane's buzz seemed to expand the reach of the blue sky. So that's the first section. Now I'm going to read a, a section a little further forward, which is when Ismael is now 18. And so it's about 16 years later in the novel. And it's about maybe halfway or a third into the novel. And Ismael has some big news to discuss with his abuelitos, Doña Josefina and Don Pedro. And so this is the section in which he's talking to his abuelitos. Don't go. What are you going to do so far away from your familia? Doña Josefina said with a catch in her throat. It's the best school in the country, abuelita. I have to go. I want to go. In the small living room that faced the red brick tenements across the street, Don Pedro soaked his feet and dropped tablets of salt into the hot water. The old man wiggled his toes and grinned into the warm night air and gently closed his eyes. Doña Josefina heated a quesadilla, oozing with monster cheese on her skillet on the stove, while Ismael slowly munched on the quesadilla quarter at the table. You don't know anybody in Boston. By the time you come back, your grandfather and I will be buried in the hot sand. Stay in El Paso and go to college here like Panchito. Abuelita, did you know that President Kennedy went to that school? Senators and presidents and very famous people have gone to Harvard. It costs more than $10,000 per year to go to this school. Jesus, Maria y Jose... Puros malditos ricachones. You'll be poor and alone if you go there. They sat down on her porch just outside the living room. In the darkness, Doña Josefina's face was momentarily lit when she struck a match to light her cigarette. She hunched over and stared at the concrete floor. The hump on her back was almost as high as her head. They're going to give me una beca, abuelita. This school will change my life. What do I know about these things, Mayelo? I'm just a poor Mexicana with nothing but this viejo in the living room with his stinky feet. What are your parents going to do without you? First Marcos, then Julieta, and now you. I know we don't count for anything, but I say don't go. I'll miss everybody too, but I'll be back for Christmas and for the summer. Abuelita, it's the best school in the United States. You'll come back a different person. Worse, you won't want to come back after you see everything out there. Why would you want to come back to this horrible nada? Abuelita, that's not true. I'll be back. I'll call you every week on the weekend when it's cheaper. I'll learn so much. Nobody at Isleta has ever been to Harvard. At least no one the teachers can remember. It's a great honor, mijo. We know that. I'm sure everyone in Isleta is proud of you. But this is who you are, she said for a moment, scanning the dark night air and the empty street. A cricket chirped in the darkness. God help you when you go to this Harvard. You will be so far away from us, from everything you know. You will be alone. What if something happens to you? Who's going to help you? 
But you always wanted to be alone. You were always so independent, so stubborn. Like you. Ay, Dios, just remember your familia, Mayelo. Go, but come back, Doña Josefina said sadly, taking a quesadilla quarter from the plate on the ground. She handed the rest to Ismael. She stared at the screen door for a moment, her lazy eye ablaze in a red light as she inhaled her cigarette. Pedro, get up and wash the dishes. This hombre is unbelievable. He will sleep all day if I let him. Get up before I go there with a broomstick and smash it on your head. Viejo apestoso. Oiga, señora! A raspy voice proclaimed on the other side of the screen door. Don't you know that you're talking to one of the kings of Harvard? Ahora verás, cabrón. They'd throw you in the trash at Harvard. That I know. So thank you for listening. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to do in this novel uh, is talk about our familias, you know, from Mexicanos, Chicanos, uh, Latinos, and and really try to explore, you know, this m mystery of the familia. You know, so many of the things that bring us together as a family, that drive us apart, are invisible. You know, whether it's love or distrust or going separate ways. So the, the novel is told from the different characters, the six different family members, of the parents, Pilar and Cuauhtémoc, and the four children. Because one of the things I think I know that I've experienced and that I certainly talked to a lot of people about is how we all experience familias in a different way. Every member experiences it in a different way. And I think the other thing I did in the novel that is a little bit unconventional is the novel is told in time fragments that move forward five, ten years. Um, I think time fragments are familias, and it's always a struggle to keep them together. So what I was trying to capture in this novel is in a sort of orchestra piece of time fragments and different perspectives is this elusive culture, this group that we have called the family and how it is bonded together by common experiences we have and also how it falls apart sometimes invisibly sometimes with major events uh, that cause severe disagreements and you'll see this in the novel between the siblings between the parents political disagreements cultural disagreements even disagreements about religion because the different siblings end up adopting different religious cultures and religions uh, per se um, as they get older. And so, so I'm trying to capture this sense of when a group is more together and when a group begins to fall apart uh, and how we can keep this group, this family, and sometimes this country from falling apart. You know, and certainly the, the novel is, uh, you could call it an allegorical allusion to the division, cultural and political divisions that we have in our country, in the United States, which I think uh, have, have frayed the bonds that we've had as a country. And so that's certainly one of the things I was exploring in the novel, to the, the politics and culture and religion that uh, the F Martinez family is facing and the problems on how to stay together as a familia. And uh, it's, you know, it's, I hope you read it and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope it also makes you think. Certainly one of the things I want to do as a writer is not just to entertain you, which uh, sometimes, um, you know, is, is goes against the grain of what many other writers are doing in this country. But I also want to explore serious ideas with my reader. I want to cause my reader to think, not just to escape into an, another world and enjoy that other world without that other world having something very important to say to the reader and maybe cause the reader to change his or her life or think of things differently. I really want to cause the reader to think differently, to uh, change the reader's life. And, and maybe that's ambitious, but that's always my goal in any story I write. I want to I want to unmoor the reader. I want. I certainly an, am unmooring myself as a writer, by the way, uh, because I do try to approach these difficult questions full bore. So I wanted to thank 
everybody who just sat and, and listened to me for a few moments. I'm certainly uh, thrilled when I get emails from readers and they tell me how important or how interesting or, or what they got from some of my work. Uh, please visit my website, which is a very active site. It's just my name, SergioTroncoso.com. Uh, and uh, I have uh, a lot of stories and essays and videos, and I always love to hear from readers. So thank you again for listening. Thank you.